Hello and welcome to Davos 2023. I'm Shireen Bhan and greetings from a very cold and very wide Davos. I don't know if you can tell, but it is snowing and quite heavily so. Uh, so fortunately, we have a roof above, above our heads, but uh, it, it promises to be a very cold week here in Davos. Hopefully, uh, we will see the conversation raise temperatures. There is a lot that's lined up. Uh, probably one of the largest delegations that Davos is likely to see in the recent years. Over 1,500 leaders from 600 different organizations. There's about 50 heads of state who will be here. Let me just quickly give you a rundown uh, of the heads of state who will be in Davos at the 53rd meeting of the World Economic Forum. Uh, you've got the Vice Premier of China, you've got the Prime Ministers of Spain, Greece, Finland, uh, you've of course got the President of South Africa, uh, you've got the Chancellor of Germany, you've got the EU Commission President Ursa von der Leyen, uh, lots of global leaders here, of course the heads of the IMF, World Bank, etc. will also be present here at Davos 2023. A quick uh, break up of what we can expect from India. We have a ministerial delegation. Four ministers will be here in Davos. Smriti Irani will be representing India here at the annual forum. Uh, and this is the first time that she's going to be here at Davos. Also, Ashwini Vashn of the IT and Telecom Minister, he's going to be here in Davos. And of course, it's going to be his first time as well. Mansukh Mandavia, the Health Minister, uh, returns to Davos. And uh, R.K. Singh, the Power Minister, will be here as well. The ministerial delegation from India will hold a lot of bilateral meetings, both with other global leaders as well as business leaders. And the hope is that uh, the resilience that India has shown through the course of the last 12 months, uh, that is the story that they hope to tell the world and also build on the fact that there are going to be more measures, more steps taken to try and ensure that the resilience moves towards a resurgence. Plenty of conversation here. Uh, ahead of the annual meeting, the World Economic Forum, of course, has warned about entering an era of poly crises. Now, uh, this is something that other noted economists like Adam Tooze, Nouriel Rubini have also been warning about, uh, that we are going to be seeing global challenges that will escalate because of the interconnectedness of the world and will be amplified. Uh, and that is what the World Economic Forum is warning uh, as we head into this meeting. And of course, uh, the big ask is that there be global cooperation. But global cooperation at a time like this, uh, when of course there are uh, geopolitical tensions uh, at this point in time, how possible is that likely to be, is the big question. But all of that is going to be something that my guest, the president of the World Economic Forum, Borge Brende, is going to answer. Thank you so much, Borge, for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. An absolute pleasure. And back to White Davos. Yeah, and thank you for welcoming me. Uh, we went to the wrong place in the snow. So, uh, that does happen. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. The, but let me start by asking you about the, the representation here. I mean, you know, we, we saw a meeting in May and the expectation was are people going to be able to come back and do this twice? And you've actually got record numbers this time around. Well, thank you for mentioning that. And uh, it is incredible because I feel it's not long since we sat here and it's true. And uh, we have never had this business participation in the history of the World Economic Forum. We never had so many... In the history of the World Economic Forum. So okay. we never had that number. And we never had that number when it comes to ministers and head of states and governments. 50 either. plus. Yeah. And also with the 300 cabinet ministers. We never had so many finance ministers coming in. More than 50. And I think that shows that also there's a lot of focus and concerns mm. about the global economy. You know, you're talking about concerns about the global economy and you've warned as part of your global risk report that the World Economic Forum puts out ahead of Davos uh, about an era of poly crises. Now, uh, you know, Rubini, Adam Tooz and others have also been warning about this as well. Uh, what are you most fearful of? And as you speak with these heads of state who are going to be here in Davos, uh, you know, you're talking about the need for greater collaboration. Do you believe that that's likely in an environment like this? We see some silver linings. We saw that the U.S. and China came together at the Bali G20 meeting and uh, restarted their uh, collaboration on climate. We also see some no, uh, initiatives on uh, stopping the fragment fragmentation of the global economy. Because the least we know need is like new protectionist 
uh, measures that will hurt growth. We strongly believe that there will be no recovery without the trade and investment recovery, and we're very concerned about the growth uh, prospects uh, in the coming year. Not for India, but for many, many other economies. Well, you know, speaking of global growth, the World Bank has cut its global growth forecast down to 1.7%, uh, percent, and the expectation is that at least large parts of the world may tip over into a recession in 2023. What's your own take on the back of the conversations that you're having with both business leaders as well as policymakers on that possibility? So there are some positive signs like uh, abating inflationary pressure now in Europe, in France, Germany, but also in the U.S. We also saw last uh, quarter the German industry production increase and not decrease. That was not really expected. But we're not out of the woods, and as you rightly said, we believe that maybe 25% of the countries are uh, at risk of a real recession. We don't think that the global economy is going to contract, but it's slowing growth. So what we need to do here in Davos is also to agree on what does it take to create a global growth compact mm. so we can avoid the 70s where we had a decade of low growth. Low growth, high unemployment, high inflation, and high debt. That is a, like a, a cocktail. Yes, a, a deadly cocktail. A toxic cocktail. A toxic deadly that cocktail. That we have to avoid. Uh, you know, but, but that's a reality. I mean, you know, inflation may be starting to ease. We're not sure just yet. But the expectation is that perhaps uh, uh, having peaked interest rate, the trajectory, at least as far as the Fed is concerned, is likely to move higher. Debt continues to be a challenge and a big one across large parts of the world. Uh, what is giving you hope that we are going to be able to, uh, you know, to be able to get this global compact for growth moving? One thing that is working in favor of growth is the new technologies. We should not underestimate the power of big data on artificial intelligence and the new breakthroughs. They can uh, move things higher up in the value chain. They can also create the necessary optimism. Another factor that we have to also take into consideration is that the second largest economy in the world that has been driving a lot of growth and also have exported deflation when it comes to prices in the last decades, China is still growing at a slow pace, but we do expect that end of 2023 and 2024, mm. China again will grow at a much higher pace. So that can also have positive impact because they're a huge market, 1.4 billion people, and if they start to demand also products from mm. abroad and they open up uh, the Chinese economy for also more domestic consumption, that can have a positive um, impact on growth. You know, speaking of China, and you've got the Vice Premier of China here at the World Economic Forum, uh, and there has been a, a dramatic shift in stance and strategy. For instance, a much faster reopening as far as COVID is concerned than people were expecting, especially on the back of the fact that they had virtually kept everything closed for the last three years. Uh, some pullback, even as far as tech regulations are concerned, real estate regulations are concerned. What are you hoping to hear from China uh, at this point in time? What's the expectation that the world has from China? So uh, we're very pleased to have Vice Premier Li He here. Li He has been responsible for the trade and economic negotiations with the U.S. And he also is in many ways the economic czar. Uh, in uh, China. So it will be very interesting the signals he's sending also uh, in Davos. But I do expect that uh, he will underline that China will continuing, continue its opening up, that uh, they expect the economy now to start uh, growing again. And it's also interesting that uh, we have the key trade representatives from the three largest regions of the world. We have from the U.S., the Catherine Tsai, Tsai, the USTR. We have Dan Valdis Dombrovsky is um, vice president of the EU and in charge of their uh, trade policy. And now Li He uh, from uh, China. And maybe uh, together with Dr. Ngozi, head of WTO, and under pressure from uh, also the business CEOs, uh, they will feel that more protectionist measures or more tariffs is not the way to go forward if you want uh, to revive growth, quite the contrary. So we are uh, moderately optimistic that we can see some progress here. Okay, moderately optimistic there. But 
Are you also moderately optimistic on what's happening as far as Russia and Ukraine is concerned? I'll ask you this in the context of, uh, of the comments that the German Chancellor has made, and he's here uh, at the World Economic Forum's annual meeting as well. Uh, he believes that there should be engagement with Russia. You shouldn't stop all engagement with Russia to be able to move forward. Uh, what's the expectation now, even as this war sort of almost completes a year? So, um, what is unfolding in Ukraine uh, is a humanitarian catastrophe because we are also seeing that civilians are being attacked. And that was what we agreed after the Second World War that we never should repeat. Civilians should never be purposely targeted. So, that's terrible. What will happen now this winter and in the spring and the summer is hard to foresee. But what we are very concerned about is that you will have a spread of conflicts. We have the Ukraine situation, but you also have had increased tension in uh, East Asia uh, and uh, also a lot of military buildup. Mm -hmm. So we have to inject more trust. We also know that the relationship between China and India is not uncomplicated either. So that also has to uh, be uh, handled uh, because the role and importance of India moving forward is increasing at uh, exponential uh, level. Uh, India is now growing uh, faster than any other large economy. There's a lot of optimism. I said uh, last time we met in New Delhi, I said it was great to come from Europe to New Delhi to feel what optimism feels like again. Huh? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And speaking of India and speaking of optimism, uh, you know, we've got, of course, a large ministerial delegation here from India. Uh, and it's been a, you know, it, it's been a a resilient year for the Indian economy and the hope is that we're going to be able to build on that. Uh, what's the expectation that uh, that the world has, especially as India has assumed the G20? What are you excited about? What are you most optimistic of? I uh, do expect that Prime Minister Mali, uh, as the president of uh, G20, will use uh, the leverage that India has to also bring the key actors together and say, hello, if you want to avoid uh, our global recession, we have to agree on some policies that will inject some optimism and growth. And what is least needed is further conflict. Mm -hmm. Because we know that even if we now implement the right macroeconomics, the right uh, also microeconomics, if there are wars, you can just forget about it. And trade and investments have to come back. We have tripled the global GDP in the last three decades. And, the, and that engine that drove that was trade. Of course, we have to adjust uh, trade policies a bit, not only just in time, uh, also just in case, some nearshoring, there will be some French shoring. But I hope that the big economies of the world, 80, 90% of areas they can still trade and not decouple because if we accept decoupling at a higher rate, mm. we're going to shave off so much economic growth. So people will come in Davos in five years and say, oh, we really regretted that decoupling. We didn't know that it led to less growth, uh, less prosperity, more poverty and all this. But at least um, we are very clear in our uh, recommendations there. And I, I think India will take on this important leadership uh, during the G20 presidency. You know, we're talking about uh, cooperation in a fragmented world. Uh, there are limited options with governments because fiscal space is constrained at this point in time and there are also limited options with central bankers today given where inflation is and monetary tools are unavailable at this point in time. Uh, the private sector, do you believe will have to do a lot of the heavy lifting really to try and accelerate growth and what, what do you expect? So the short answer is yes. Uh, private sector needs to continue to invest. They have to drive the economic growth. I think now that we will possibly see, uh, have seen the peak on uh, the interest rate. And if the interest rate is not stabilizing, going down, it will be easier also for those that are indebted or have a lot of uh, loans. We also will see companies that want to leverage and invest in the future can then uh, take up uh, loans and gear uh, portfolios and etc. more if the interest rate uh, is uh, lower. But you're also right if we have no, if we're seeing a big recession coming our way and not the shallow one, uh, 
uh, many countries during COVID used all they had and a little bit more. That's why the debt increased so much. Some countries have 150% of their GDP in debt. Of course, they have no fiscal ammunition left, but there are countries that do have fiscal ammunition left, India, uh, Germany and some other big economies. So let me end by asking you, what would, what would uh, your hope be uh, for Davos 2023? What, to your mind, would be the two or three things that you would like the forum to get done this time around? That the leaders here agree on no more protectionist um, measures, no more economic fragmentation, agree on companies taking more responsibility for going net zero by 2050 because we know that climate change has a huge cost, not only for humans, but also on the economic side. We know parts of the world is almost not possible to live in during the summer, it's getting um, worse. And then I would say the third would be to also think about the future, putting the new technologies to work for um, humankind. That would be my third wish. Borge, it's always a pleasure. We wish you the very best of luck. Appreciating you joining us here as we kickstart our coverage from Davos at the 53rd uh, annual meeting of the World Economic Forum. Thanks very much for your time. We are going to take a break, but we've kickstarted our coverage. We will continue to be live through the evening. Don't go anywhere. We're back in a minute with more.